In my life, I've always strived to see the positive side of everything I can, to the extent that I tend to like things that are generally considered bad. For example, despite its universal ire, I really love the Nokia N-Gage, and Sonic R, a universally panned game, has stayed on my top 5 favourites game list since I first played it back in 1997. I also see the fun in weirder stuff like the Chin F22 Pro, where the usability is questionable at best. However, some things are just plain bad. Some things have so little going for them that it's almost impossible to get any enjoyment out of them at all. Here I have the Retroid Pocket 3, which is absolutely not one of those things. The Retroid Pocket 3 is utterly awesome and has absolutely blown me away. Let's go take a closer look. Hello and welcome to RetroBreeze! If you're a returning viewer, you may know that I had a few choice opinions regarding the white colour Retroid Pocket 3 I received. To address that elephant in the room, I'm just going to say that yes, I still stand by everything I said about that white colour specifically in that video. In fact, even more so after having the white model and enjoying it so much for a couple of weeks. However, I said it all in that video, so I'm going to go light on that particular criticism in this review. I will touch on it toward the end. The Pocket 3 is a gaming handheld from Retroid, which runs on Android 11. It has a Unisoc Tiger T310 processor with a PowerVR GE8300 GPU. It sports a 1334x750 4.7 inch touchscreen, 2 or 3 gigs of RAM depending on your choice, 32 gigs of onboard storage, and an almost familiar gamepad layout, complete with two analog sticks, stacked shoulder buttons, and an Android home button. Oh, and it also has SD card support, USB-C for charging and peripherals, and a headphone jack. It also has HDMI output up to 720p. So let's take a look at the control layout of the Retroid Pocket 3. You might immediately notice the very minimal face. Start and select are nowhere to be found, and that's because they've been relegated to the top edge of the device. This is definitely a strange choice, and I can't say I've quite gotten used to it even after a couple of weeks. It's just kind of strange that it's different than every device I own right now. However, on that note, I really, really appreciate the choice to do something a little bit different. The minimal look has taken precedent over the traditional layout, for better or worse, but honestly, I really like the clean look. It has made hotkeys kind of strange, at least at first, and I do kind of always forget that the buttons are up here for a second. But all things considered, it's an interesting, albeit divisive, move, and I'm all for doing something different. On the other hand, I don't really think that having the buttons on the front would have subtracted from the overall look at all. I'll leave it up to you. The D-pad on the Retro Pocket 3 is almost identical to the Odin, and is based on the original PS Vita shape. However, the clickiness here is a bit mushier than it is on the Odin. It feels good to press each individual button, but full rotations don't feel quite as tactile as I expected. Still, this is a 9 out of 10 D-pad compared to the Odin's 10 out of 10. The face buttons are the same light clickiness that the D-pad has, and it works really well. They're very responsive, with a surprising amount of travel for simple tactile switches. The buttons are noticeably small, around 7mm across. However, even more noticeable is the distance between them. There's a full 1cm between opposite buttons, which is honestly a heck of a lot of space for such small buttons. Let's compare it to a Switch Joy-Con. The buttons here are the same size, but there's only 9mm horizontally and 8mm vertically between them. The result is that the Retroid Pocket 3 buttons require a bit more reach with the thumb, and it's a little more difficult to press two buttons at once, especially if you have smaller thumbs than me. I really noticed this when I was playing Mega Man X2. It was kind of hard to jump and shoot at the same time. This isn't really a significant problem. I got used to it pretty quickly, but it is something I noticed while playing. By the way, for a limited time, if you order the Retroid Pocket 3 from the official store, you'll get a rubber membrane kit included, so that you can switch out the buttons for a different feel. I haven't done it on mine yet, but having the option is cool. I'm guessing that Retroid will end up selling these kits as well in future. The dual analog sticks, just like the D-pad, are carbon copies from the Odin. They're very small and slightly recessed, sticking out barely more than the buttons in the D-pad. These are not Switch Lite analog sticks, they're much, much smaller than that. I really like these sticks just like I did on the Odin, but smaller adjustments like fine aiming can be a little difficult, as we'll see with Goldeneye later on. Now the triggers and the shoulders, which are just sublime. Despite not being analog, the triggers have a surprising amount of movement and move in a great angle. The clickiness of them is just so satisfying. The shoulders themselves can be pressed from absolutely any angle, and they'll still actuate. Whether you're coming in from the side, or resting your fingers completely over the top, or just kind of poking in a random direction, they'll still work. It's a really, really great design. I even kind of wish my Odin had these. 
Also, because of the overall small size of the Retroid Pocket 3, it's very comfortable to rest your fingers on the shoulders, even when you're using the analog sticks with your thumbs. This can often be a problem with devices that have both analog sticks at the bottom, but here it's really not. Seriously, I cannot fault the shoulder button layout, it, they're just awesome, they're perfect. Alright, as for the other inputs, I gotta say that the home button on the right and the volume buttons on the left are really, really great because despite being directly underneath your hands, you'll never accidentally press them, thanks to how they follow the overall shape of the shell and how stiff they are to push. It's kind of weird to have the volume keys on the left side, but that's just another quirk on the Retroid Pocket 3's design, to be honest. The Pocket 3 runs Android 11, so if you've ever used an Android smartphone, you know what to expect. The interface is zippy to use and very modern. You can access the Google Play Store to download your favourite apps if you want to, but if you're the suspicious type like me, you can choose not to enable Google stuff and sideload your apps manually. This is a fairly vanilla Android experience, but there are some specific settings available for the Pocket 3, including changing the control layout, the game overlay, and stuff like that. Overall, it's really nice to use. In addition, you get the Retroid Launcher, which is a front end for launching your games and apps. It's not entirely pick up and play, but after a little configuration, the launcher allows you to see all of your games in a nice interface, complete with box art. It's not perfect, and actually the identification of the games can be a little flaky. All three Sonic Advance games are detected as the first one, for example. But overall it works very nicely and is a really convenient way to make your device feel more like a games console and less like an Android phone. You can easily flip between the Android interface and the launcher, and you can also update any incorrectly scraped games yourself. To be perfectly honest, in comparison to literally everything else out there, I think this might just be the best front end available from any manufacturer in the retro handheld space. A lot of work continues to go into the launcher and it's really changed a lot in the last couple of months, even on the Pocket 2 Plus. I really think that despite a few shortcomings, Retroid has really knocked it out of the park with this launcher, and I really hope to see it continue to improve in the future, especially given that other manufacturers in this space seem to have more or less given up on software for their devices, and just rely on the community instead. The Retroid Pocket 3 also comes with its own gaming overlay. Just swipe in from the right during any game to gain access to it. Here you can map touch controls to physical ones, record your gameplay, clean running processes, change the brightness and more. It's a really great feature that's really convenient and functional. Again, this is identical to the Odin. It's almost like these two devices were made by the same company. Hmm. Anyway, during gameplay, the Retroid Pocket 3 is just a joy to use. It's small and relatively light, weighing about 240 grams. It's also very thin, and that thinness actually gives it a really premium feel. The back is completely flat, other than the flared area for the triggers, and I do really wish there were some small grips here like there are in the Odin. I think that small amount of extra plastic would have really improved the comfort of the device just a bit. That said, the Retroid Pocket 3 is already really comfortable in the hands. The smooth plastic and soft rounded edges are just about perfect for being maximally comfortable, whether you're primarily using the face buttons and d-pad or the sticks and shoulders. The only minor issue I found was that the natural position of my fingers when using the sticks blocked the two speakers but a small adjustment resolved this minor complaint instantly, and permanently. Oh, speaking of the speakers, they're pretty much fine. I never really noticed them being particularly incredible or particularly bad. They work perfectly functionally, and that's all I have to say about them. I wasn't expecting them to be amazing, so I'm just glad they're not bad. Here's a couple of comparisons. First, the Retroid Pocket 3's big brother, the AYN Odin. The Retroid Pocket 3 really makes the Odin look like an absolute tank, and is just dwarfed in comparison. And here's the Miu Mini as well, just for kicks. Turning the devices around, you can see the grips on the Odin here. Despite its small size, I still think that the Retroid Pocket 3 would be just that much better with a similar shape, but I sense that Retroid really wanted the most minimal design possible here, so it's fine. By the way, I should mention the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus for comparison here too, even though I'm not showing it. The two devices share the same chipset for the most part. Performance-wise, the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus and the Retroid Pocket 3 are identical. I still love the 2 Plus, especially for being a 4x3 screen device but the Retroid Pocket 3 is a really, really great evolution in terms of quality and ergonomics. It's much less blocky and thinner than the 2 Plus, and overall just seems higher quality. When it comes to performance, the Retroid Pocket 3, like the 2 Plus, is more than powerful enough to play all the retro systems and then some. Everything 2D up through Super Nintendo will run without any problems at all. Game Boy Advance in particular looks wonderful as it fills a large amount of the screen. PlayStation runs perfectly and looks excellent with widescreen hacks. Many games will work well upscaled to 720p, but something interesting here is that the screen is so small and sharp that even 1 or 2x looks amazing and jagged edges are pretty subtle either way. I don't think anybody's going to have an issue playing games in 1x on this device. 
Nintendo 64 performance is really, really great, and I had no problems running most games at the device's native resolution. Diddy Kong Racing is a twitchy racer and performs really well. GoldenEye has a little slowdown, but it does on pretty much everything. But also, the smaller sticks here really did make it more difficult to aim than I had expected. In fact, I might even say this is borderline unplayable just because of how difficult it is to move the sticks a small amount. Even Dreamcast runs really, really well, and the widescreen hacks look great on the Retroid Pocket 3. You know, I don't think I've ever seen Dreamcast games playing this well and looking this good on a device this small. Sega Saturn performance was surprising. This game, Sega Touring Car Championship, needs to run at a stable 60 frames a second to be at all playable, and the Retroid Pocket 3 kept up absolutely perfectly without a single drop, although this particular game is still nearly impossible to play unless you have superhuman reflexes. You should go check it out, it's a fun game, if you like punishment. I was especially pleased at PSP performance. In many cases, I was able to upscale games to 2x resolution with no issues at all, and in nearly every other case, 1x works great and still looks perfectly good, again because the Retroid Pocket 3 screen is so small, and makes jagged edges less jarring. Actually, the Retroid Pocket 3's overall size, and the 16x9 aspect ratio display, just makes it absolutely perfect for PSP gaming. It really is such a pleasure to see PSP games on such a lovely screen, and on a device whose size is very reminiscent of the original PSP. Game streaming is also really great thanks to great network performance, although admittedly, the screen size can make some elements look absolutely tiny and hard to see. It's not a fault of the screen at all, it's just rather the nature of it. In many cases, this isn't an issue, but in something like Dragon Quest Builders 2, I had to really, really squint to see the text and interface in a lot of places. When it comes to GameCube and PS2, I'll say this very plainly. This is not the device to buy, at all. I see many people asking what will play, or how to get certain games to play, or what the best settings are. But the reality is that the Pocket 3 just is not powerful enough for these systems. You might get lucky with one or two games, or perhaps you might find that running at a 0.5x resolution will make some games somewhat playable, but you are going to find the experience to be frustrating and disappointing. I'm neither frustrated nor disappointed, because this device was never supposed to play these systems and my expectations were set as such. Consider anything that works as a bonus but you really shouldn't be looking to the Retroid Pocket 3 for any GameCube or PS2 emulation at all. Check out the Odin or the GPD XP Plus instead. By the way, I do have to say that I believe that Retroid has kind of misled their customers a little bit by just implying that the Pocket 3 would be able to play any GameCube or PS2 games. It simply cannot, and they really shouldn't be advertising it as such. Now, finally, I gotta talk about this screen. This is by far my favorite thing about this device. It is quite simply one of the most vibrant and colourful screens I have ever seen, period. It really has to be seen to be believed. The colours just pop in a way that is almost difficult for my brain to process. And the screen is so sharp and small that it almost doesn't look like a screen at all to me. It's often like I'm looking at a cartoon, but not through a screen. I don't mean to be dramatic, but it really is seriously next level. Whether I'm streaming Skyrim with its autumnal pastel colours, or Sonic with cartoony saturated colours, everything just completely pops. Whether it's pixels or polygons, it all just looks amazing. It's just extremely engrossing, when just looking at the beautiful colours and brightness makes me so happy, regardless of what I'm playing. Oh, and I even tried playing in literally direct sunlight with the sun shining on the screen, and I could still see more than enough to play perfectly well. The screen here is 10 out of 10. I cannot fault it at all, and it is in a class all on its own. I might almost think that the Retroid Pocket 3 is worth getting just to see the screen alone. Alright, well I've covered quite a lot in this video, so I'm going to wrap up here with my likes and dislikes. Starting with my likes. First of all, the value. For around $150 shipped, the Retroid Pocket 3 really raises the bar for budget handhelds, just like the Odin did for the mid-range a few months ago. It's not the cheapest, but price to performance and quality is unmatched right now. The screen. The Retroid Pocket 3 has an absolutely mind-blowingly good screen, unlike anything I've ever seen on a handheld. Its colour, vibrancy and brightness is really second to none. Rumour is it's using an iPhone screen and I believe it, it's that good. The build quality. Again, this feels like a bar raised for more budget handhelds. The Retroid Pocket 3's high quality is really noticeable in the hands and in usability. The size. The Pocket 3 is the perfect size, and it's definitely pocketable, and it's especially nostalgic for the PSP. It's thin and light, and pretty much everything, even 1X, PS1 and PSP games, look great thanks to the smaller screen. The quirky decisions. Love them or hate them, I'm glad that Retroid made some unusual decisions for the controls here. I don't want everything to start looking the same like smartphones do. And it's just interesting to see a different design angle. And the software. 
The Retroid launcher is not perfect by any means, but it's still one of the best software experiences on a retro handheld. And like I said earlier, some manufacturers have totally given up and are just exploiting the community when it comes to software. That's no good. And now for my dislikes. The flatback. Yeah, the flatback of the Retro Pocket 3 would be substantially improved with some grips. Although it's already really comfortable, so it's really not a big deal. The white model. Yes, yes, okay, I know, the color isn't all that important. But the fact is that the white model of the Retroid Pocket 3 is more of an off yellow, and it's still being missold on the online store. After having it two weeks, I thought I would get around to it and just like, not care anymore. But every time I see this thing with the light on it, or in shadow, and it's yellow and not white, it's really frustrating. I don't think it really matters whether you're bothered by this or not. I just think that Retroid should come clean about the mistake and update the render on the website and just be honest about it. And finally, sketchy marketing. I know, I know, this isn't to do with the device itself, but I wanted to say it anyway. Retroid has pulled some really weird marketing tricks with the Retroid Pocket 3, which I think are really unacceptable. They advertised better PS2 performance, thanks to fractional resolutions in an app update. But that's the PS2 emulator Aether SX2, it's not their app, and they shouldn't be marketing based on that app. Which leads me into my next point. The Retro Pocket 3 does not play PS2 and GameCube games, but it is marketed like it might be able to. I'm sorry, in my opinion, it just cannot and so it shouldn't be marketed like it can. Another thing was that they launched this product saying that it was four times more powerful, but not more powerful than the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus like you might expect, but more powerful than the Retroid Pocket 2. That would be kind of like Nintendo launching the new 3DS XL and saying it was a hundred times more powerful than the DS, not the regular 3DS that came before the new 3DS. Those two were pretty much the same, but the DS is a completely different ballgame. It just made no sense for them to market it like this. And they are still marketing that Android 11 provides a 30% performance boost over the previous version. It just doesn't. I mean, maybe in the interface, but gaming performance between the 2 Plus and the 3 are pretty much identical. That's not to say that the 3 isn't better than the 2, because it certainly is. Really, I just think that Retroid needs to let this device stand on its own. They don't need to use shady, sleight of tongue marketing to sell it. It's really, really good. They should just be clear about what it is. At best, the marketing is just kind of weird, and at worst, they're just trying to trick people who have already bought a 2 Plus. But they shouldn't have to, because the 3 is better, and in fact, I think it's a great purchase even if you already have a 2 Plus. Anyway, sorry, I could rant about this for hours, but I already did that about the white color, and the outcome was not very good for me, so I'm just gonna can it there. Alright, let's finally wrap this up. The Retroid Pocket 3 is one of the best retro handhelds that has ever been introduced to the market, and it really, really blew me away. It's just such a joy to hold, to play, to carry around outside the house. I really didn't expect to love it as much as I do. There were a lot of rumors and a lot of drama floating around about this device when it first launched. But other than the dingy white model which I've already covered in detail in a different video, I found none of the complaints. I've had no apps crashing, I've had no screen flickering, nothing. It's been a really flawless experience while I've been using the Retroid Pocket 3. Overall, I think the Pocket 3 is an absolutely fantastic device at a very, very impressive price. I've absolutely loved my time with it, and there's absolutely nothing else I would recommend for somebody who had a $150 or less budget. So that wraps up this review. Now I haven't done an awful lot of reviews on my channel, and it's something I want to do more of. So if you have any feedback, comments, criticism, please drop it in the comment box below. Or you can find me in the Retro Handouts Discord too. Any feedback is greatly appreciated. Anyway, thanks very much for watching Retro Breeze, and I look forward to seeing you again very, very soon.